Good afternoon. My name is Captain Lily Golson, and I'm the coordinator for the Commission Corps Pharmacy Mentoring Network. This is the first training that um, we're having remotely for our mentors, and I think this is a, a wonderful time for us. We've been discussing this for several years, how we could get all the mentors together and um, brainstorm and exchange information, but we never could figure it out because so many mentors don't attend the COA meeting, and that was the only meeting that we knew of where we could get so many together. But I think coming up with this concept, although not ideal, it would be nicer if we were all in a room together and could see each other and exchange information, but this is a start. And hopefully uh, we'll be able to build on this and offer um, tr additional training in the future. So your feedback at the end on the evaluation form will be very useful and will give us some ideas of how we can approve uh, the program in the future. Now, uh, to tell you up front, um, I've modified the slides to a, a little bit uh, from what's on the website. They're basically the same, but there will be a couple of changes which you probably won't see, but I just wanted to let you know that. The goals of this training are twofold. Um, first, we want, we want to impress upon you the importance and value of mentoring. I think uh, many times people just see this as something to put in their file and they're, they're not really uh, cognizant of how important um, this task is, uh, the impression that you can make on another individual. So we hope that you'll go away feeling a little better and feeling a greater urgency towards mentoring. Also, we want to empower you to be effective mentors in CCPMN. And we hope to do this by providing you with an overview of the program, informing you of the responsibilities of a mentor, introducing you to the tools that are available for mentors, providing you with steps for getting started, and hopefully through the exchange um, at the end we can answer many of your questions regarding uh, CCPMN and mentoring. I always like to start off with a story because many times as we go about our uh, lives we forget uh, how we got started, how we got to where we are. So I'm going to start off and tell you a story about myself and hopefully um, what, what I'm sharing will resonate with some of you and you'll understand and probably experience some of, some, some of the same things. So that's where we're going to go with this. But once upon a time I dreamed of becoming a pharmacist. It was something that I've always wanted to do. And I think when I got into pharmacy school, uh, when I started my rotations, I, it, it, it became apparent to me that I wanted to practice in a clinical pharmacy setting. I just couldn't wait to get out of school and don that white coat so that I could be there to uh, uh, impact the health outcomes of my patients. I wanted to counsel them, uh, share with them, uh, find out the drugs that they were on, go over their profiles, and do all the things that I was taught in school because this, this seemed ideal for me. But as time progressed, um, uh, I think uh, I, I, after I graduated from school, I got my first job at a very large chain and those um, dreams and visions I had of myself as the um, community pharmacist quickly began to uh, disappear and reality set in where I was um, bombarded with prescriptions all day long. So you're stuck behind the pharmacy. As soon as the door opens, you, you, the phone's ringing off the hook and you're hearing the overhead announcements, pharmacist line one, doctor's office line two, copy line three, and I was in, in um, management, so you're there and you've got patients outside uh, lining up, looking at their watches because they're, they're frustrated and tired because they're having to wait five or ten minutes for their prescriptions, and then of course the order comes in and you've got to go check in the toilet paper, so you've got to lock the pharmacy and go to the storeroom, stock room in the back so that you could check in everything. And of course when you come back, you know, your patients are staring at you and they, they don't want to be counseled. 
and I think it came to the point where I really didn't feel like counseling. I was too overwhelmed and I just wanted to come in and get the work done. So a friend of mine um, knew my frustration and one day she called me and asked me had I considered United States Public Health Service. Well, I hadn't. She'd seen it in a journal. And I said, the United States Public Health Service, what is that? She said, well, I don't know, but it's in this journal and they're recruiting, so perhaps you can call someone and, and see what it's about. So, of course, I did that evening, and I spoke with um, a recruiter, and actually for some of those who are 06s online, uh, Ted Pukas was um, the, the associate recruiter I spoke with, and he was a pharmacist. So um, I guess by the time people call recruiters, they're ready to make a move. So his job is to find the hook that would get me. And I'm a person who loves to travel. And one of the first questions he asked me was, did I like to travel? And I told him, oh, yes, yes, I do. That's something I want to do, but I don't get uh, much opportunities with my current job. And so he went on to tell me about 30 days leave a year. I couldn't believe it because you know if you've ever worked retail, it takes five years before you get two weeks and you never get 30 days. So that was very exciting to me to know that I could have 30 days leave a year. And then he mentioned that I could fly anywhere in the world. We had a military uh, base free on military aircraft. I couldn't believe that. And then at the time when Dr. Coop was the Surgeon General, they were encouraging officers to change jobs every three years. And that sounded good to me too because I wanted to stay fresh, I wanted to do something different. So this sounded ideal to me. So I sent in the information and, uh, and of course I wanted to work for FDA, you know, FDA is a very glamorous place. Everybody wants to work for the FDA and so did I. So I sent in my application and requested FDA as um, the spot I wanted to work in the Washington area. And a year passed, I heard nothing. So uh, of course I'm getting very frustrated because I've been tired of the job but I'm still going there trying to do it. And then I got a call and this, this will be kind of interesting a uh, note for when, when uh, you, you're a mentor, and so this will have some significance later. But I had the supervisor at St. Elizabeth's called me and said, uh, I understand that you're trying to get in the FDA, and I said, yes, I am, but I haven't heard from them. And she went on to tell me that they had an opening at St. Elizabeth's if I would be interested. Well, I wanted to work for the FDA. I didn't want to work for a mental institution. And all I had were visions of one flew over the cuckoo's nest, so I really wasn't interested in that. But she encouraged me to come, come down and interview, and uh, you know I could always change my mind. So I said, well, you know, what did I have to lose? So I went over there and interviewed, and she was very, very good at what she did. She showed interest in me. She asked me, what did I like doing? And I told her I liked teaching, and I liked patient education. So she told me she had a position that I could do that, but of course I would have to, you know, check cassettes and do the typical things that you would do in a hospital, which was fine with me. And I think one, one thing she told me when I left that really impressed me uh, was, she says, Lily, we need you at St. Elizabeth's. I've never had anyone tell me that they needed me. And that made such an impression on me. So when I left, I was also, um, someone at an HMO was also trying to get me to uh, come work there, but comparing that with 30 days leave, uh, free travel around the world, and someone who uh, thought enough to call me at home and tell me that they needed me, that, that was the deal clincher. I went to St. Elizabeth and uh, figured I'd be there for a couple of years and then get on to FDA. But six years later, I was still there. And when I did finally leave, I left tearfully because it was the most rewarding duty station I'd ever had. I, I, I just can't uh, even explain the experiences that I had there, but it was a memorable one. So I left and I finally, after six years, got that job in FDA. And perhaps um, 
many of you have experienced the same things where you, you, you have uh, an expectation or you envision certain things until you get there. So for some of you, it may be uh, Indian Health Service. You might be tired of all the traffic jams and the cars in the big city, so you can't wait to get out to that quiet reservation with the beautiful mountains and the background and the clean air until you get there and you discover that it's 100 miles from the nearest mall. Or you might um, have come from a small town and you've heard about um, the Bureau Prison site in Hawaii. <laughs> And so you sign on to work for BOP, but then after you get there, it's, it's a little daunting to uh, recognize that all of your, your patients are behind bars, that you're serving the, um, I guess you would call them the less desirable members of our society, um, that you have to lock every door, uh, that that's a constant, that um, you don't have the freedom to walk around, that the facility is surrounded by barbed wire. So sometimes you kind of think that you make a mistake once you get in there, but you know, but you're here. And then, like me, I've always wanted to work in the FDA, as so many others. But when you get here, um, I think many people don't realize that you know you are pretty much confined to an office, and uh, you're surrounded by applications, and you're setting up meetings, and you're you're you know you're you're. Uh, 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 calling firms all the time, so it's a very administrative job, and sometimes you do feel a bit yeah. overwhelmed. But I think when you look at the benefits, at least for me, when I considered the benefits of the public health service, I figured, yeah, I could do this for a couple of years and move on. This is a career, unlike the private sector where you have to quit a job and go somewhere else. This is a career. This is something that I plan to do for 30 years. So I could do this for a couple of years or the three years and move to something else. However, lately, and I think lately more so than in the past, other things have happened. The core is changing and we're bombarded with all of these acronyms and, and, and all of these expectations. You know, you're trying to get used to the job, but then you, you also an officer. So you have to think about cores. You've got to think about transformation. We're hearing that quite a bit, and I think I've been in for 18 years, so transformation means quite a bit for me because it's such a change from the core that I joined. And then deployments. You know, we're getting emails now that there's a hurricane um, on the horizon and getting us ready to deploy for two weeks, and yet you know you have this job back at home. And then you have basic readiness where you are always having to uh, make certain everything is up to date. And then you have CCRF and OFRD and a BOTC and ACO. So, and then of course, there's the ever elusive promotion. We all are looking to get promoted. It's, it's, it's there. You, 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 everyone needs to make an 06. So you're doing whatever you can. And so all of this is just kind of swirling around in your head. And pretty soon you just feel like you just want to pull your hair out. That you just can't take it anymore. You just feel so overwhelmed and frustrated. Well, if we, those of us on the phone who have been here a while, you know, who have been in the core a while, if we're feeling this kind of frustration and this feeling of, of being overwhelmed, imagine what a new pharmacist just graduating out of pharmacy school coming into the core for their very first duty station have never worked anywhere before come in and are faced with this they're faced with learning the job plus learning how to be an officer they haven't had to so you're here and you're, you're not you're not accustomed to this and it can be overwhelming and very daunting and many probably feel like maybe I made a mistake. Maybe I should have stayed in the private sector. So that's when we as mentors can step in and make a difference in a new officer's life, in their career. We, um, as more seasoned officers, can motivate, encourage, nurture, teach, offer leadership and serve as role models for these new officers coming in. And it's not only the new officers, even those of us who have been around for a while. 
O4s are striving to become O5s. O5s are striving to become O6s. And even at the O6 level, you still have maybe 10, 15 years at that rank. And you don't want to just become complacent and ineffective. So we're all striving to improve and to do better. And that's why we have to work together to help one another. We have many associate recruiters out there who are affiliated affiliated and visiting all the colleges of pharmacy, uh, talking to the new graduates about coming into the Corps, and once they get here, we want to keep them. It's very, um, uh, it's, it's costly, and it's, um, it, it wastes a lot of time to get a new officer here and then lose them within the first two years. And that's why we really, really want to avoid that. I was looking last night at an article that uh, was presented, or a, 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 um, a message that was presented at a nursing convention. And this is very apropos, I think, to what we're trying to do. And what um, the nurse was saying is that we must adopt a mentoring mentality. Our relationship with one another will clearly be the key to our survival as a profession and as a nursing organization. And I think that's for, uh, true of us in the core. We must begin to motivate and mentor our colleagues on the job, in the classroom, and we must share a desire uh, for collaboration instead of competition. And I think in this climate that we currently have, with everybody trying to be promoted, I think this is very, very important that we need to share a desire for collaboration instead of competition. And most of all, establish a connection so that we create environments where respect, learning, support, and sharing are the standard. And I think that's something as mentors we need to take to heart because what um, we're doing as mentors is very important. There are many studies out there that show that mentoring is the one thing, the most important thing that can, can determine um, the retention and attrition of an employee. Um, when we recruit people in, we want to keep them in. So if an officer comes in and um, they feel part of the family, you have people who have befriended them, who's, who, who are available to help them, to answer their questions, they're more inclined to stay. But if a new officer comes in and is assigned to a remote station and they're the only pharmacists out there, there are no more officers, you know, for hundreds of miles away, which, you know, you can find in an IHS site, it becomes very lonely. You're away from your family in a lot of instances. This is a totally different environment. It's a culture shock. And it makes it very difficult for some to adjust. But I think for us to be here, we're more senior. We have 12, 17, greater than 24 years of experience. We've been around. We've learned to weather the storm. That's when we can step in and make a difference. And I hope that you take that, uh, this message away, that what you're doing is very important. It's not something that you just sign up for so that you can put it on your CV or put a letter in your file and never have any attention on acting upon it. Because it's important, we need to build the core up. If, we're, if our future or we as a core are to survive, we've got to have numbers. We've got to show the public that we're important. Every time you turn around, there's some congressman wanting to get rid of us because they don't think we're, we're valuable, that we're needed. And that's why we need to have numbers. We need to get out there. We need to do things that are noteworthy so that people will recognize that we are a viable, valuable force at, to the health of this nation. And that is something that we really need to take to heart and work on. Okay, so what is CCPMN? Well, it's, it's a formal, voluntary, one-on-one -on -one mentoring program for the active duty Commission Corps pharmacists. Um, the mentor-mentee commitment is six months in duration. The goal of the program is to develop and retain, and I think that's the important word here is retain. And as I just mentioned to you, about uh, the importance of mentoring and, and large companies are well aware of this. They have spent 
lots of money developing former formal mentoring programs to keep their employees there. So we want to develop the officers and then we want to retain them. Um, um, a cadre of confident, competent, well-informed pharmacy officers to be a source of, source of strength and pride for the United States Public Health Service. So what do I do to qualify? Well, first of all, I would recommend that you learn about CCPMN. There are a lot of people who want to volunteer, but they, they know nothing about um, um, CCPMN, the network. They've never seen the website. But I invite you to go there. Um, if you go to the Farm Pack website, there is a link there for the mentoring program. There's a lot of uh, valuable information. There's an overview of the program. It tells you the role of uh, the mentor, the mentee, the responsibilities of each, um, of supervisors. There's uh, resources available. So it's, it's a very useful site. And I strongly urge you to um, look at that um, site. Um, secondly, make certain you meet basic readiness standards. You're going to serve as a role model. So you, we cannot have uh, mentors in the program who are not, um, who do not meet basic readiness. Ensure that you have a positive attitude about the PHS, the core pharmacy profession, and I would say life in general. A positive attitude can go a long way in, in, um, in how you approach, especially the changes that's occurring um, in the core. I know some of us who have been around for a while, it's very um, challenging to uh, do some of the things that we're currently doing. Um, I hear people say that if they wanted to join the military, they would have, and they, they don't like the direction, but I think a more positive approach would be to look at the leadership is thinking about our future. They're trying to get us in a position where it would be more difficult to eliminate us. And we need to work with them and move forward and try to see the glass half full rather than the glass half empty. So I encourage that. Um, we don't want the naysayers and the complainers to be mentors. We want people who are positive, who, who, um, who uh, support the mission of the Corps, who love being officers, these are the people that make the best mentors. Make certain you have time and are willing to share your time, talent, and professional expertise with a more junior officer. And I, I mean that literally, that to have an effective mentoring relationship is going to require some time. You need to plan, know what you're going to discuss with your mentee, and let the person know that you are interested in them. Um, you know, just shooting off an email saying, if you have any questions, contact me, is, is, is not being an effective mentor. And uh, just as an effective mentor can keep someone in the core, and any effective one can make someone want to leave the core, and we don't want that to happen. Um, we also want to make certain that you have a polished professional image and wear the PHS uniform with pride and distinction. And I, I, I really want to stress that because I see, es especially with a lot of the 06 officers, people just are not wearing their uniform appropriately. Uh, they have inappropriate jewelry on with it, especially for the females. Um, hair's too long, uniforms wrinkled, sweater has all those lint balls all on it, just really no pride. In, um, in yourselves as an officer. And I think we need to be reminded that we have a lot of pri uh, military pharmacists coming from other services, coming over to the public health service. And it doesn't send a very good message to see how we disregard the uniform and really don't take it as part of who we are as they have been taught to do. So be cognizant of that. Carry yourself well. Make sure your uniform looks nice because you're representing the core, you're representing the service, and you shouldn't be an embarrassment, especially if you're going to try to mentor someone. And also want to ensure that you have a working knowledge and understanding of the current direction of the core. Things are changing. Um, I think the Farm Pack does a good job of sending us emails to keep us abreast of what's um, occurring. Make sure you read those and um, are aware of the changes because your mentee probably will know. They'll learn it in, in a training course, and so you want to make certain you know as well. So you feel like you qualify. So now what do you do? 
Well, first you fill out the mentoring network form, which is a volunteer form and submitted to uh, me, the CCPM coordinator. Um, I will keep that on file. I have them filed by Optiv. So I have one for FDA, for NIH, um, IHS, BOP. So I keep them on file until a suitable match is found. And, and what, what that means is that we uh, match based on the geographic location and Optiv of the mentee. So if, if there's someone in, um, Anchorage, Alaska, more than likely I will be selecting a mentor up in Anchorage because there's nothing else around. I might go down to Portland or somewhere close by, but we're trying because on the evaluation forms, many of the mentees have expressed they want to see their mentor. They want to be, uh, be able to see the person. This doesn't always happen because of the geographic location of many of the facilities, but we do the best that we can. So that is how you will be selected based on where the mentee is located. Once you are matched, then we've, we've come out with a contract. This is something new that we will be launching after this training. As I mentioned earlier, we're finding that, you know, unfortunately, and I think it's because it's a benchmark that uh, many of the mentors, or not many, but yeah, there's a, a number who are just volunteering just to put something on their CV and to have something in their file. And that's not what we want because when you, know, when you call them, well, then, well, they're really not ready. They're really not interested. Uh, I've had instances where mentees have mentioned uh, they've never talked to the person outside of one time. I even had one girl, her mentee's in the, mentor was in the same building and she just accidentally ran into him where people really aren't taking this task to heart. It is just something that they're doing to put it in their file and they really don't care about mentoring. So we came up with this agreement where the mentor will sign and what the agreement basically says is that um, you are agreeing to contact your mentee within two weeks of receiving notification from CCPMN that you've been selected as a mentor, that prior to the first meeting that you will review, and this is for a new call to active duty mentors, the welcome packet, and I'll talk about that briefly, and the checklist for mentors, and become familiar with and be prepared to discuss the topics on the checklist. I will make every effort to interact with my mentee a minimum of two times a month. Now, you should, uh, I, I would say have some sort of a formal interaction with your mentee once a month. But you can send an email or something just to let them know that, you know, you're available or you, you know, see how they're doing. But um, with that first meeting, I think um, you should try to do something like telephone. I, I'm, I'm not a fan of email. Email is just very impersonal to me. But whatever you and your mentee work out, but just be in contact at least two times a month. I will be responsive to the learning needs of the mentee and be sensitive to the time and energy needed for a successful mentoring relationship. I will contact the coordinator at the earliest opportunity for any assistance um, that I need if any areas of conflict develop. And I will return the mentor evaluation and checklist within two weeks of completing the mentoring relationship. So there's a place for you to print your name, sign it, put your PHS number, date it, and then send that to me and then um, you will be matched um, with your mentee. After that, ensure that you are uh, not in the mentee's direct line of supervision. And typically, I will ask you that before I match you because we want the mentee to feel comfortable, to be able to discuss any problems or concerns they have. And uh, doing that with a supervisor might not be the most appropriate thing to do. Prepare for a six month commitment with your mentee. This is a six month match. There's a lot to be done in that time, but we felt six months was better than a year. Um, um, that, you know, the longer you wait, usually you're gonna wait to the last minute to do everything anyhow. So we thought six months would be a good time to um, get uh, the, the items on the checklist covered. Plan ahead and organize your mentoring activities. Uh, to minimize the impact on job duties and responsibilities. And I think that's becoming more and more important now um, because a lot of, and I've noticed that particularly in the FDA, 
where a lot, I think after Hurricane Katrina, a lot of the supervisors have gotten a little leery about hiring officers, and I've noticed that the numbers are kind of going down. And I don't know if this is true in other office, but I have noticed that. But don't take this and you're spending an hour out of the time mentoring. Try, if possible, if possible, to do it at lunch or do it before or after work so that it, it is not uh, something else that's taking you away from your, your job responsibilities. Also establish ground rules with your mentee. You need to discuss how many times you're going to meet a month, how are we going to do it, uh, are you going to email? Are we going to set aside a TCON? Are we going to, you know, um, whatever the case may be, you need to have the ground rules. How should the mentee contact you uh, and vice versa, but just have ground rules set so that you'll know how to conduct yourself during this six-month period. Schedule meetings in advance. Put it on your calendar manager. You know that every third Thursday at 6 o'clock, you and your mentee are going to meet. Make it important. Don't, don't put it as something that can be changed, that, well, something came up, I can't do it. Make it an important event that's on your calendar and scheduled and try to meet that schedule. I would recommend keeping a log or journal, journal of your activities because, you know, when you're doing your cores or even when you do the evaluation, you need to keep track of what you did and when you did it. And I think that will help you to see that you've covered all the activities and, and give you a good working document for, for you know, the future. Uh, complete and submit the evaluation form at the end of the commitment. And, and um, I'll discuss this a little bit further, but the letter of thanks is not issued until after I receive uh, the evaluation from the mentee. And the reason why I do that is because so many mentees have commented that they've never heard from their mentor or heard from them one time, and there really wasn't an interaction. So I'm not going to just uh, send out a letter until I get that evaluation, and the mentee actually discusses what was discussed, and I put that in your letter, and that's when that will be issued. If mentoring a new call to active duty pharmacist, and I think if you recall May of last year, uh, we sent out a directive that all new uh, pharmacist officers called to duty will be assigned a mentor. So if you're one called to do this, I, I encourage you to review the welcome package that will be emailed to you. Members of the PAC developed this package. It's, it's very, very good. Um, has a um, lot of useful information. And in fact, we were so concerned that this information might not be used that we took um, that information and put it in the checklist. So the items on the checklist are coming directly from this welcome package. And both will be emailed to you with your letter telling you who your mentee is. Um, telephone the mentee to introduce yourself and get acquainted. I would do that. You know, we want you to contact within two weeks and someone will call to make sure that the mentee has been contacted. But I would call, introduce myself, um, and plan that first meeting. And at that first meeting, I would spend time getting acquainted. I would like to know more about you. Show an interest. Um, you know, where are you from? How did you get interested in the core? What are your expectations of the core? What are your expectations of this mentoring relationship? Get to know the person. Show a genuine interest. This, you know, uh, being empathetic and caring of a person is something you really cannot fake. So I encourage you to really, uh, if you're going to mentor, to really plan to do a very good job at it. Um, dust off those communication skills that we use as pharmacists. And I was th thinking about this because sometimes people feel like they're you know, uncomfortable talking to this person they don't know. But I said, you know, communication for pharmacists has always been our bread and butter. People come in to talk to us. We are there. We're constantly giving and receiving. I don't care if you're in the hospital. If you're in the community, whatever the case, people always came to see their pharmacist. And we've been ranked, we used to be ranked first, but we dropped behind the nurses, but we're ranked second as the most ethical and trusted profession. And that's because people feel like they can go down and tell us anything and we're, we'll keep it. It's not going to be uh, circulated around the neighborhood. People are very comfortable. They can order their drugs on the internet. 
but they will come to their pharmacist to find out if it's safe, if there's any interactions. And I think that's commendable for us as a profession, prof profession that we have that kind of uh, uh, impact and uh, on the community that people feel that comfortable with, with us. Um, be accessible. You know, people can come in the pharmacy at any time. They don't have to call and make appointment. That's why they love pharmacists so much. We're readily available. Try to be that way for your mentee. You know, uh, of course, you're going to set some ground rules where you're not going to be called all the time. But I would be accessible if they have a question or whatever. They can contact you via email or, or telephone or whatever uh, you two decide on. Actively listen. Listen to what the person is telling you. Just like when you were counseling a patient, you were gathering information, you were empathetic, you were listening to what they were saying. Do that with your mentee, even if um, you are having to do this via telephone. Don't just put the person on um, hands-free and you're about the office doing something else and totally not paying attention. Because that comes across very clearly, so you don't want to do that. Actively listen to your mentee. Empathize with him or her. Um, counsel when needed um, and this usually comes into play after someone misses promotion they get very concerned they need guidance they didn't get promoted what shall I do and that's when you'll probably be doing your most counseling is at that time uh, be motivational you want to motivate your mentee encourage them if they're going through this this frustrating period where there's too much to do and they're feeling overwhelmed try to offer some suggestions some little things that they can do to kind of relieve the pressure and kind of motivate them to hang in there and of course overcome barriers we always overcome barriers we've got the pharmacy counter that's there you've we've got HIPAA laws that we're supposed to counsel but you've got a line of people so there we've always managed to be creative to overcome the barriers and this is very important with this program because many times the mentor is in a different state than the mentee. So that really requires some creativity and hopefully at the end of this session we can get some ideas from people on how people manage to overcome that. Um, if, you're, if you're career development mentoring, do, do the same things as the one for the new call to active duty uh, and follow the guidelines. It's the same thing. A mentee is a mentee. Uh, but your direction may be a little bit different. The checklist for, for the career development mentor is a little bit different because now these officers have been in, so they're wanting to polish their CV. They're wanting to make sure their uh, file is up to date. Uh, so there's some different things that's on that list, so make sure you familiarize yourself with that. Um, the useful tools, which I've been talking about, the welcome package for the new call to active duties, the mentor checklist, there are two different ones, and they will be sent in your letter when you're matched. The CCPM website, and I strongly encourage you to visit the Farm Pack website. There's so much information on there, and you just really need to be familiar with what's available. So if your mentee asks you something, you'll at least have some idea of where to go look. The DCP website, the CCPM is on there, so you want to get on there um, and find out what's there, contact phone numbers in case uh, your mentee needs um, to contact someone. Just be familiar. And then, of course, fellow officers. Always have someone that you can talk to, someone that you look at as a role model, someone who's doing what you wish you could do, and call, call them. If you, if you get a question, your mentee gives you, asks you a question you don't know, call someone. How, you know, where can I look to find this out? So, so never... Um, just totally ignore your fellow officers because we're in this together. This is a network and we're working one with another. And then this is just the front page of the welcome packet. I think it's about a 15 page document. Excellent information. You will be receiving this and as I said, this, this is what the checklist, the items on the checklist are coming directly from this document. It tells you about the core values. It tells you about ID cards, what to do on a base, military courtesy, it goes through everything. So this will come to you where you don't have to go out and search for this information, it's there. But I would, when you get a topic, I would go to the DCP website or some other source and get additional information. Because you don't want to get something that your mentee is having and you're reading the same thing they're reading. So I can do this by myself. But try to look for some additional 
tidbits of information that you can provide to augment um, what's in the package. And then these are the checklists. This is the checklist from the new call to active duties, and that's what comes. These topics come directly from the welcome package. There's the mentor checklist for those um, career development mentors. Um, there's the evaluation form for mentors. So I think if we can work together um, as a network, that we can help support each other and pull each other up the ladder of success. So that ends the formal, formal part of um, the presentation. And I have some questions that I'm typically asked. We'll go over these and then we'll entertain questions from out in the field. And if someone has some um, something to add to this, please feel free to uh, chime in. Question number one, I sent in my mentor volunteer form but have never been matched. Why? As I mentioned earlier that the match is mentee driven, it's, de it's dependent upon the optive and the geographic location of the mentee. So um, unfortunately sometimes you may volunteer and it may be a while or you may, I, I hate to say this, but you may never be called but it's, it's strictly dependent on the mentee. So don't feel badly about it. Um, I keep you on file, but if someone comes along, I will call you if, if it's in the area where you are. And also remember that to mentor informally that you document this on your CV. Uh, and it does count um, as meeting the benchmark. Question, I have tried to contact my mentee, but she or he does not return my calls. What shall I do? And I just had this question asked of me yesterday. And I think it's the main thing is to call me, the coordinator, uh, and I will try to work with you and the mentee to resolve the problem. And I've, I've had this comment before where uh, mentors have tried to contact the mentee. They don't return the calls. Uh, you know, maybe the mentee doesn't need anyone, you know, especially like places like FDA. We have so many um, officers here. A lot of mentees don't feel a need for a mentor. So if, if you're matched and you have this problem, contact me immediately. Don't wait until the six months is up and then you call and tell me, well, gee, I never could contact my mentee over the six months. Then it's too late. But let me know up front and I will make note of that so that won't be, you know, like held against you. Question, I don't like my mentee. What should I do? Well, this is a formal program, and so we aren't matching based on personality. We're, we're looking at other uh, um, qualifications. So it's very possible that the chemistry is not there. If that's the case, just contact me. Um, we can just simply um, you know, assign the mentee another mentor, and that's, that's not a problem. If I volunteer to serve in CCPM, how will my activities be documented? Um, at the end of the match, um, we have a QC manager, uh, Commander Sherrod. She will notify both you and the mentor, and you will be asked to submit evaluations. So once I receive the evaluation, this is when the letter will come to the mentor, and you can have that for your file. Could I be called upon to mentor even if I do not formally volunteer? And the answer is yes. Now that we are to match all new call to active duty officers, many times we don't have volunteers in that area. And so I try to look to find someone geographically close to the person if possible, because you want to help them with uniforms and things like that. So it's very possible I will call to see if you are willing to um, mentor. Um, if you can't, no problem. And I think that's the next question. Um, if you decline, no problem. I would prefer you to decline than to accept and then not do a good job of it. How do you know if the mentor has contacted the mentee? Well, at, at two, two weeks, three months, and six months, the QC manager contacts the mentee to first see if they've been contacted, uh, second to see if they're doing okay, and then to notify both that the six months has arrived and to turn in their evaluations. Now that's the end of my portion of 
um, the training and now I would like to open it up to the field and for any questions or comments that you would like to make. Don't everyone speak at one time. Okay, I have a question. Okay. Uh, Commander Terry Martin, in Oklahoma. Okay. Um, uh, you had mentioned that you cannot uh, enter anyone in the direct line of your supervision, but I had also heard that you could not do it if they worked at the same place, like mm. the Indian Health Facility. No, that's 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 um, that's not correct. Oh, okay. No, you can do it at your same site, and I think, no, we've never had that. It's always um, for a supervisor. Uh, we don't want um, a supervisor to be the, 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 the mentor, but I have had mentees. Now, if you request your supervisor, I will go ahead and match you because, I, I, you know, a lot of the mentees now are taking the initiative, and I appreciate that, that if they know someone that they really admire and that they want and if they call, and or you know put it on their form that that's who they want. I will match them. But I did fill out the um, entering network form about a year ago. Uh huh. Um, do I need to? I never was notified. Why <laughs> that? So you just keep that on. I didn't send you a letter. No. Because <laughs> I always send a letter after I get the. If you volunteer. Yes. I send you a letter. I send you a letter. Do you have my email address? Because I keep copies of all the letters. Okay. So um, if you didn't receive one, let me know. Um, you have my email address? Yeah, it's on this form. I printed it out again. Um, we have a resident here. And actually she said that she had been assigned. Uh, well, she was never con uh, contacted and told that she was assigned. But I know you have new guidelines for that now. But she said she received a call from someone uh, two years ago saying that he was a mentor. But... I had no further contact. Okay, me. see that that has occurred, and that's why we're trying to correct that. So, could she request me on the request? Oh, sure. Sure. Okay. Sure. Oh, definitely. Okay. And 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 that is a, a problem, and and we have addressed that. We did a survey, I think, about four or five PAC meetings ago, where we actually called up um, the mentees that had been matched in the last year to just find out what their impressions were and what their experiences had been. And it was really quite an eye-opener that uh, many of them hadn't been contacted and um, some of the things that I just mentioned, which is not acceptable. So that's why we came up with the contract. That's why we decided to do this training. And um, we developed uh, separate checklists. So that's, those are the things that we're trying to do to correct that problem. Because if, if a person signs up and there's, there's nothing I can really do, um, you know, I can't monitor who's signing up. You send it to me, I just take it to heart. Or if when I call you, oh, yes, I'll do it, and then you never call the person, that's not acceptable. That's not acceptable. Or, you know, um, and I will call because a lot of the mentees, you know, they're reluctant to say anything. You don't want to say anything negative about any, anyone. But I will call and find out. And most of them, you know, uh, have had good experiences. But then, of course, when you have a bad experience, that just kind of travels. And we want to, um, it would be nice if we could eliminate it. But when you have, you know, different personalities coming together, even though we're pharmacists, we're communicators, we should be able to overcome this. This is a, you know, a professional thing. We should be able to overcome it. But still, we're, we're people, and you might have problems. But if you didn't get a letter from me, you email me because I keep a track of them. Anytime you volunteer, I will send you a letter thanking you for volunteering, and I will say on there that I will keep your application on file and will call you once there's a suitable match. So I send that to everyone who volunteers. Um, but the main letter that you want to get is the one, thank you for, for mentoring. That's the one that you want to get because that's saying that you actually did it. And I think uh, Commander Sood mentioned two PAC meetings ago that just because you volunteer and if you never do it, you've never really done the act. So, so be careful of that when you're putting that on your CV and whatever because that second letter is the one. And in that letter, I will put the topics that you discuss with your mentee and I will actually put that in there so that you'll have it for your file. Thank you. 
Correct. Uh huh. Any other questions? I have a quick question. This uh -huh. is Lieutenant Commander Dion from FDA in Denver, Colorado. Oh, Denver. I'm from Colorado. Great. Okay. I recently, I, I've been a mentor in the past, and uh -huh. I was currently working for the uh, Bureau of Prisons at the time. Uh huh. And I've got a transfer to the FDA. I'm actually starting through now. But um, my question is do I have to fill out another pharmacy mentoring network form and put the FDA? Yes. In my yes, I would do that because I match within the optus. So I will be calling you for BOP if I saw someone, you know, needing someone in BOP. So I don't have an updated record. So that's a very good question. Anytime you move or change any of your information, let me know um, and so that I can update because I'll move your application to the proper file. But, you know, the reason why I was asking actually is because I would still be effective as a mentor to someone who is a BOP. Partner. Exactly. Exactly, and, and I would note that because when I'm looking, depending on the location, I will see if there are people who've had, I, I have people here in Washington who, who mentor IHS because they've been out there even though they're here. So they have the experience. If I see that you've been in BOP or IHS, yes, you are considered, but that way I'll have you in the proper file because if, if it's BOP, that's probably where I'm going to call you, and I don't know that you're in Denver. So if I have an officer that's in Oklahoma, and I call you, well, you're, now you're in Denver, and I, that's why I say I try to get people geographically close to one another. Okay, but do I need to send another, an additional copy of the CV along with this? No, you don't need to send the CV. Just send me uh, the form volunteering to mentor and just tell me that you've changed, and I'll pull it out of the other file. All right, sounds great. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Dr. Goldson? Uh-huh. Hi, this is Commander Christine Yu with Immigration at El Centro, California. Uh-huh. Hi. Uh, 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 first comment I have is that I think this is great that you have clearly outlined expectations for both the mentee and mentor. Mm -hmm. um, and second, uh, I have a question regarding now the offices that are being called to active duty is uh, required to go to mandatory training. Uh huh. Um, so have you had feedback from uh, people who have attended the training? Because some of the information will be presented at those trainings. Exactly. And then. Um, and then, and then we have the welcome package. Um, so the new offices that have come on board, uh, have you had received feedback as to how effective this is, or is there too much overlap? Or No, we haven't, because the welcome package just came out a couple of months ago, so that's relatively new. Um, most of the new CADs are going to training, but some are not, because I know when we did the survey, some had not attended the BOTC training yet. So we haven't gotten feedback on that, and that's something that we'll probably have to look at. And I think when you, if, and you are going to be assigned a mentor, uh, that this is something to be discussed, that uh, when, you, when you get together, you have the packet, the mentor has the list, you can just say, I dis we discussed this in the BOTC training, you know, and, and, and that way the mentor doesn't have to worry about that. So that's when you communicate and try to identify what type of information would be most useful f to you. You know, you might now be able to know that. You know about the uniform. You know military courtesy. So that part you don't need. Uh, but uh, perhaps you don't know about um, benefits or you need some information on uh, the different types of leave, things like that. So that's when you and your mentor can discuss that and, and get that clarified. Yes, I, I think this is, um, uh, this is this this makes it much more organized because I didn't have a mentor. Of course, I didn't sign up, but I, I was surrounded. I was at the FDA, so I got a lot oh, of Oh, okay. I thought your name sounded familiar. Okay. There. Mm -hmm. But, um, yeah, it was kind of, you know, you got information from here and there. So this is a lot more organized than how new officers um, um, can come on board and feel comfortable. Yes. And later. So we're trying. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Other questions? Captain Golson, this is Captain John Coleman in Santa Fe, New Mexico. How are you? Oh, just fine. How are you? Good. Thank you. Other question. I first um, enrolled uh, in the mentor program in... 2000, and I was in Anchorage, Alaska, and I had a mentee in 2000 and 2001. Um, we need to complete the application process again, or? No, because what I'm going, 
I, I don't destroy your applications. I keep them uh, because as the mentors come, uh, mentees come in, that's the first thing I do is go to the file to find out, okay, who do I have in Anchorage? Or who do I have in what, Tahlequah, Oklahoma? You know, I look to see. And um, if I don't have anybody that's close, that's when I will look at, and, and literally, I use MapQuest, and I will put the mentees zip code in, and then I will just go down. I have a list of all the sites, and I will put the zip codes until I try to find something that's kind of driving distance. You know, within a couple of hours, that's, that's what I try to do, especially for the new people. Because if you can kind of work together where you could kind of meet, that's, that's ideal. So um, that's what I try to do. Um, if you've moved, I need to know that so that I can keep you on file. But I never throw away any of the applications. I always keep them on file. And can we, is it acceptable to send an email to you sure. with our new contact information? Yes, you can do that. Okay. You can Thank do you. that. Uh-huh. Any other questions? evaluation forms that uh, we need to fill out at the end of this is that oh oh what are you asking about it uh, yeah was I, I don't guess I received that off it's the it's on the farm pack website okay with the slides that you downloaded I think they had three documents on there okay. now just a quick question what did you think of this training I mean did you find it useful um, and I guess you can, I don't know if there's a space on the evaluation to put that, but what did you think? What, what, are your, what is your overall impression of this? I think it's great. <laughs> so, I mean, was it, you could follow the slides, um, it was clear. I received were the slides, so I need to go in and look at it again, I guess. Yeah, that's on the Farm Pack website also. Okay. Yeah. Any other thoughts? Anybody else? What did you think of this? This is Captain Coleman. I think um, you know the, the slide presentation and the presentation was very well organized. I think uh, the mentoring program uh, has defined criteria and expectations of the mentor and the mentee. So excellent job. Okay. Well, you know, I, I appreciate, and I, I guess our time is drawing nigh. Uh, are there any other questions before we close this? One question. Okay, I have a question here. This is uh, Commander Fritch, and mm -hmm. my question is, do you have any idea about how many mentees might need placement? It looks like, uh, when I was involved in the program before, it looked like we just <coughs> focused on call to active duty, and now there's another component with the career development, and I'm just wondering how many people do you think that you might be placing? Do you have any idea? Um, the, well, with the call, uh, with the career development, that's they send in nominations, you know, they okay. send in a request for a mentor. Okay. We don't get many of those. Okay. Um, unless they've missed promotion. <laughs> and then that number increases. But we don't get as many requests for a mentor as, you know, of course, anybody called to duty automatically gets a mentor. So it's, it's a manageable number. Um, I, I think the most challenging part is trying to find someone geographically close. That is what takes the most time is just going down trying to find a suitable officer because a lot of these new officers are the only one in their town so that makes it a little more challenging any anything else well if nothing else and I think our time is here I like to end this by thanking the following uh, those on the committee with me Captain David Racine who is our my database manager Whenever um, I make the matches, I send them to him. He's the one that sends you the letter with all of the attachments. So uh, without him, I would be nothing. So I really appreciate all the work that uh, David has done. We've been working on this. I met him at St. Elizabeth, and we have been together for a number of years. So I appreciate him, uh, as well as Commander Cassandra Sherrod. I also met her at St. Elizabeth, so it's nice to make those contacts. So we, we're all here in the FDA, and I appreciate she's the one that contacts the mentee at two weeks to three months and the six months to let them know uh, to turn their work in and to let me know if someone hasn't been contacted so that I can follow up. And then also I just really appreciate the farm pack 
and the Career Development Committee. They've been so supportive of the mentoring program this last year or two. I really, really appreciate their buy-in. And uh, for the Career Development Committee, the co-leads, Commander Michael Scheiber and Commander Mary Krimsner, uh, Lieutenant Commander Deverett Patel, who's here with me, who coordinated all of this with the remote telecommunications, and I appreciate his efforts. Commander Nita Sood, of course, who's the PAC chair, and Rear Admiral Rod Robert Pittman, our CPO, who's also been very supportive of this. So without them, we wouldn't be able to do this. And then, of course, special thanks to all of the mentors who have served over the years. I really appreciate all the work that you've done. Uh, the future mentors, hopefully you will be encouraged to sign up after completing this training. And then, of course, to all of you who participated in this program because you helped to make it successful. So with that, I guess I'll say so long.